let's go ahead with um, John Gilby, if that's OK, who's now going to speak about the national assessment of um, genetic introgression that was published um, at the tail end of last year. And John, for those of you who don't know, is a genetic analyst at Marine Scotland Freshwater Fisheries Laboratory and uh, has a, a general interest in genetics and genomics um, of salmonid and other fish species. So I'll hand over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, uh, as Charlotte said, I'm going to uh, give an overview of the uh, work that we've been doing over the last four years or so looking at uh, the impacts on the genetic integrity of wild populations um, from um, integration of genomic material uh, from farm escapees. Uh, the report is published and on the Scottish Government website last October, I think, um, so a quick Google should be able to get it for you and there's much more detail in there, of course. A um, bit of background, um, fish escape, we know they breed with uh, wild fish, uh, we know that, they hybridise. Uh, and this introduces genomic material from the farm fish into the wild populations. And uh, we all know as well that uh, farm fish are very different from uh, wild individuals. Um, they've been selected for traits of interest to the industry. They've been undergone domesticated selection where uh, they're selected to do well in a um, captive environment. And they are much less fit when introduced into the wild than wild uh, fish. Uh, and importantly, the hybrids of um, these um, breedings are less fit and this can impact on the wild population in a negative way. Uh, and this impact can be cumulative over years uh, and uh, impact the viability even of wild populations in some situations. And so it's really important that we try and get a handle on just what levels of integration are occurring across Scotland. And we didn't really know this. There was a report a few years ago, a very good report uh, done under the rafts banner, which looked at some West Coast rivers, but we didn't really have a picture across the whole country. Um, but we did have the NEPS program going on, as you know, and as you were probably all involved in, um, where um, we had a very good survey design done by Ian and his team um, across the whole country. And we piggybacked on the back of that to get samples. You were already out there, you and your colleagues, um, electrofishing, collecting the fish. And so we asked you to collect the fin clips for us so we could look at the uh, integration. And, and we're very grateful that you, you did supply those uh, excellent resource. Um, and we, we turned this into what's now called the National Integration Programme for Scotland. So we have now NEPS and NIPS, and we do like our acronyms as scientists. Um, and this, the, the data I'm going to produce it, uh, um, give you an overview here, is from the year 2018-19. So we've got last year's collections now in the lab. Um, they will be screened, but but this is the, the first couple of years of collections. Um, so the screening we did, we had more samples than we actually could get screened. So we, we sort of based our screening on some criteria here. We wanted to get a look across the whole country. So we had sites from each region. Um, we want to focus especially down the West Coast because, of course, that's where the uh, main production is. Um, so we took all the sites that we had down there. And we looked at those, um, but we were also interested in freshwater small production. So um, where NEPS, because NEPS was a random design, um, where NEPS didn't have the coverage we, we, we really needed around those sites, we worked with the biologists in the areas to pick some extra sites and also CPRASTUS to do a few sites that weren't covered, including the Shetland, which wasn't included in NEPS. Uh, so we ended up looking at uh, 252 sites, nearly 3,000 samples, and uh, between one and 30 fish uh, screened per site. So I should just say that the results here and in the report are actually a site level overview, so very much a quantitative one. Um, so really we should be looking at patterns here rather than absolute values. The absolute quantitative values will come out when we integrate our data with the NEPS models and get regional um, looks at levels of integration in the same way that Ian and his team do with juvenile identities and the work on that is, is very much underway, but this is just a, an overview of the, of the site level stuff, so you should look at patterns here. Uh, I won't go into too much details of the techniques, really we followed what was being done over Norway very closely over the last few years because they've already got a programme of, of monitoring in place, but we did create our own set of genetic markers which were uh, good at separating Norwegian origin farm fish and Scottish wild fish because of course Norwegian origin farm is, is by far the largest production in, in Scotland and that's why we looked at that um, but they weren't affected by the, the genetic phylogenetic um, 
structure that which we have in Scotland anyway. So we, we wanted to use the whole set across the country. It was good at farm wild differentiation, but not affected by the structure of the stuff we had. Um, and once we screen the fish, we calculate what we call this P wild value, which is we take a set of reference samples of wild, which we choose to try and capture all of the genetic ration, variation across the country and farm fish. And we compare our unknown individual to um, and if it looks like a, uh, if it's a purely wild fish, it will have a P wild of one, a purely farm fish of zero, and then a continuum depending on how much genomic material from the farm it, it has in between zero and one. For example, a first generation cross will have a P wild of about round point, point 0.5. Um, there's a bit more to it than that, but that, that's the basic premise. And then we classified our sites based on a uh, traffic light system, the same as that used in Norway um, to allow direct comparisons. And that was the green, yellow, orange, red, um, green having no genetic changes, and then yellow, some genetic change up to 0.65 integration, and then 0.65 to 12.5, and then 12.5 or more for the red. And the, again, these levels were uh, based on the, that used in Norway to allow us to, to make the comparisons. Um, so on to the results now. Um, here's the map of the results in the traffic lights. Just to say this is the two maps are the same. Um, we realised that the red green is not the best for those that are colourblind. So hopefully the smaller version and there's a, a full version in the report should be better for that. But if we just look at the picture across the country, I think it's quite clear integration is occurring and it is occurring in areas where there are uh, aquaculture production, either marine or freshwater. Um, when I had this data in the spreadsheet, I could see that there was some integration going on. But when I first plotted it on the map, I was quite well staggered actually about just the, how close the relationship was between where the integration is happening and where the production is. I mean, it really does stick all really tightly to the areas. And you can see I've used the dotted lines to sort of um, divide up the country a bit and I'll just look at that in a bit more detail here. We can see the areas where there is significant marine uh, aquaculture production, uh, West Coast, Hebrides, Shetland, we do see integration occurring. Um, uh, I think on the West Coast, you could say perhaps where there's the highest aquaculture in the central area, there's probably most of the red so they're perhaps the biggest impact, but that's just me looking at it. That's certainly a, uh, not um, statistically valid yet. Well, that will come out when we do um, the modelling approaches with Ian, but certainly where there's production there, there's uh, impacts, but it is a um, patchwork. So you do get the red next to the green, next to the orange, etc., cetera, um, which I'll come back to later. Um, and the same really in the Hebrides and Shetland production and impacts. Uh, if we go on to look at the other two areas, uh, the north and the east, uh, really little down the east coast, um, uh, very little actually, which you might expect, no production there and uh, no marine production and little impacts. The only two really areas where there's significant impacts is where we have some freshwater smart rearing. So there's two areas we have freshwater smart rearing on the Shin and the Ness on the east coast. And in both those systems, they're the only ones we really see any significant integration occurring. And we've done some work on the Shin previously where we, we know there are scapees in the system there and um, they're obviously breeding. Um, the only other point is the, the two yellow ones in the central there on the upper Tay, and that's on the Iraq T, um, excuse my pronunciation, um, which is a, an unusual one, not expected really, considering the rest of the East Coast. Um, there could be a number, number of reasons why those come out yellow. I cannot rule out that, that a farm fish got up there. I mean, they have been observed in the rivers and spawned. Um, but what I think is more likely is that that's a, a very genetically distinct population up the top of the Tay for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, it was one of the last ones to be recolonized after the glaciation. And my colleague Eve Coelia uh, published a nice paper recently that showed that, um, which means it's probably genetically distinct from some of the other rivers, but also it's had anthropogenic impacts. There's a hydro on the system and there's also stocking including at one of their sites there. And when I look at the data, they're just significantly a, a across the line from being green. So I think what's occurring there is that we tried to capture all of the genetic variation in our reference samples, but the most extreme genetic, natural genetic variation we have in the country, we didn't quite capture enough to, to say, but but I can't rule anything else there, but we're looking into that in more detail anyway. 
Um, and then the southwest, I think this was probably the most, most surprising uh, for me um, outcome that we didn't find anything in the southwest area there, even though it's quite close to some of the high production areas. Um, don't really know why we can speculate why um, there is a big obviously the, the current that flows northward so if, if there are any escapes perhaps the fish move more move north or going to the areas closest to the escapes and don't make it south too much although of course fish have been escapees have been seen in the in the southwest rivers um, there does seem to be evidence that it's things like the health of the population the size of a wild population the size of the rivers um, may um, impact the integration. Um, if you've got a healthy wild population in a big river, the impact is going to be less than a small population in a small river. Um, maybe the water chemistry there, they don't like it, but uh, yeah, but whatever the case, we, we didn't see any there. Um, we'll, we're trying to understand better what, what, what causes these patterns. Um, and just, just to put things in context a bit, this is our map on the left. And this is the Norwegian from their latest reports, the same color coding and the same um, um, levels of classification. And the, the bigger map is the integration and the smaller insert is their aquaculture production uh, locations. And you can see the picture is very similar actually, although obviously the Norwegian situation is much is worse than ours. There's much more red and, and much less green. Um, but we still we do get this patchwork even even in Norway, even in some of the areas like the big fjords, the Hardanger fjord and uh, the, the Sogna fjord, which is probably the most dense aquaculture production in the whole world. There's a lot of red there, but they're also green there in amongst all of that. And so we do see this patchwork again um, in the same way we do in Scotland. And it, it's something we, we both us and the Norwegians are trying to understand more about what causes some sites to be um, impacted and some not. Um, so, so yeah, that's the overview of, of where we are and 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 a comparison with Norway. And just to to finish on some some future research directions of what we're doing at the moment and what we're thinking of doing in the future. So we're we're obviously not with all techniques. This was the first go at it that we've done, and we've got some development to do. Um, won't go into details here, um, but this second one is, is very important, the quantitative analysis. So as I said, that was just a site level overview, um, but what we really want to do is, is to utilize the power of the NEPS modeling approach to in incorporate our data into that and get these regional um, quantitative estimates of integration. And, and Ian and I and others are, and, and our statisticians at Marine Scotland that have been well on the way to, to getting this done. Um, but of course, once we measure integration um, and and continue to measure it to see what the temporal patterns are etc the question then becomes okay we have integration what does that mean to the wild populations you know um, what does that mean to growth age smolt age um, sea age ability to migrate etc all of these things which have been shown in, in other studies to be impacted by this hybridization integration what does that mean in Scotland? Because some of the other studies or all of the other studies haven't been done in our situation. You know, it's it's mostly been Norwegian origin farm fish against Norwegian wild fish. You know, in Scotland, we've got Norwegian origin with Scottish wild. So how does that impact these things? Does it make it worse or better? Or well, we don't know at the moment. Um, things like the teenage age class mortality and indeed lifetime fitness, which is the bottom line and, and the population level effects we really we're beginning to start to think about how to get a handle on. Um, we've got great data with the NEPs that we can incorporate in this juvenile densities, size and age, all of that kind of thing we can look at now because it's the same fish that we've used that, that Ian's used for the, for the NEPs analysis. And so we can use that. And we're also thinking about some perhaps bespoke um, monitoring on some sites that may be able to pull out some of these important uh, phenotypic and population level impacts. Uh, and once we've got that, and it's probably a couple of steps down the line. It's certainly not where we're at now, but what we would like to do is to say, OK, you see this patchwork. Why? What what creates what makes a site more liable to be impacted than another one? And obviously density of, of aquaculture in an area is, is the main determinant. But what about within that area? Um, things like um, the size of the river, the size of the wild population, um, where the river is in relation to open water, i.e. how far up the lock or the fjord is, is, seems to be important for that and 
once we try and get a handle on that, we, we want to be able to, well, it would be nice to be able to model it and say, okay, you know, if you put a site here or if you had production density of this in this area, then this would be the impact. And if you moved it here, you might lessen the impact, that kind of thing, try and inform this, this um, knowledge base um, management that we heard about yesterday as part of the salmon strategy. Uh, and of course, we have the NIPS program now going forward as part of that salmon strategy and discussions underway now about just what that's going to look like, i.e. how many, um, what's the gap in years, how many, once every every year, every three years or whatever, what, what the survey is going to look like going forward is now part of the discussions on the implementation strategy of that salmon strategy. Um, I think that's me. I'll finish there. Thank you.